Good morning, Monique. It's been a long time since I've read to you. I've had a problem. I ran out of tape, and then I finally did remember to buy some. Then nobody remembered to bring them in the house, and I looked all over the house for them, decided they were in the car, then I was going to do it yesterday morning while Norris goes to prayer group. That's a favorite time for me to visit with you, and he had the car, and the tapes were still in the car. And then when he brought them in, they were so cold, we thought they might not work. And so, here I am ready to visit with you. Okay, well, <clears throat> I'm still in, Corinth in Ephesians. And I'm ready to start. I'm starting in the fifth chapter. Now we're ready for Philippians. And Philippians was the, is the joy book. A book that I truly enjoy reading. And it's a book that I, when I first truthfully began studying the Bible, it's when um, your dad was just little. And... Uh, one of the teachers, Coyla Cook, who was a fifth grade teacher at Chesterfield. And I think her father had been a minister, and he had preached in Lyons, and she ended up marrying a man from Lyons, and so she stayed in the community. Her maiden name was Flora, Coyla Flora. Isn't that an interesting name? And she and my cousin Audrey, who were both teaching in Lyons at the time, had a very eventful summer. They went out to Durango, Colorado, and run a little um, uh, hot dog stand because it was godforsaken country and was only uh, needed during the summer when tourists went through. And so Audrey wrote uh, her uh, the story of her summer sojourn in uh, Durango. And in fact, we went through Durango a couple of years ago, which is, now it is a mining town. And so she wrote it for a women's club in her town, and her daughter liked it so well. And so Audrey had written some other things, and so her daughter said, send me all those things that you've got in the drawer. Because when her husband died, she was lonely, and, and so she began to reminisce about things in the past. And, and so she sent these, she thought, well, someday when she was gone, her kids might read these and enjoy knowing about her past life. And so she uh, sent them to her daughter in Columbus, and lo and behold, the daughter put them into a book. And so Audrey sent me the book of it this, this winter, and I treasure that very much. Well, anyhow, back to Philippians. And this is what we taught at uh, Beulah Church one year for Bible school, and I learned so much about the book of Philippians, and it's been one of my favorite ones since then. It starts out, Paul and Timothy, servants of Christ Jesus, to all the saints in Christ Jesus at Philippi, together with the overseers and deacons, grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, and in thanksgiving and prayer. I thank my God every time I remember you in all my prayers. For all of you, I always pray with joy because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now, being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Jesus Christ. Have you ever heard that word verse before, Monique? It's a very precious verse that we are confident that he who began a good work in you will continue to carry it to completion. And that's what we pray for you, that he began a good work in you, that it will continue. And I'm sure when you were in the motel, you knew that the Lord was there just as much as he was with you in New York. And just as much as he was with you in Tecumseh, Michigan. It is right for me to feel this way about all of you, since I have you in my heart, for whether I am in chains or defending and confirming the gospel, all of you share in God's grace with me. God can testify how long, how I long for all of you 
with the affection of Christ Jesus. And this is my prayer, that your love may abound more and more in knowledge and depth of insight, so that you may be able to discern what is best and may be pure and blameless until the day of Christ, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. Paul's chains advance the gospel. Now I want you to know, brothers, that whatever has happened to me has really served to advance the gospel. As a result, it has become clear throughout the whole palace guard and to everyone else that I am in chains for Christ. Because of my chains, most of the brothers in the Lord have been encouraged to speak the word of God more courageously and fearlessly. It is true that some preach Christ out of envy and rivalry, but others out of goodwill. The latter do so in love, knowing that I am put here for the defense of the gospel. The former preach Christ out of selfish ambition, but not sincerely, supposing that they can stir up trouble for me while I am in chains. But what does it matter? The important thing is that in every way, whether from false motives or true, Christ is preached, and because of this I rejoice. Yes, and I will continue to rejoice, for I know that through your prayers and your and the help given by the Spirit of Jesus Christ, what has happened to me will turn out for my deliverance. I eagerly expect and hope that I will in no way be ashamed, but will have sufficient courage so that now, as always, Christ will be exalted in my body, whether by life or by death. For me to live is Christ, and to die is gain. And that was such a theme of a song that Koila, this teacher, uh, had sung at some time, and so she was able to find it. And that was the theme song for our class that time. We were 8th, 7th, and 8th graders that we had, and it was such a great time to have those children because they were in an age where they were making decisions about the Lord and how they would act towards him and how they would be either ashamed or not ashamed of him when they were with their peers. So let me read that again. For me to live is Christ and to die is gain because we gain as we go to heaven. We went to a funeral yet, or to a funeral home yesterday. The neighbor lady in the next house east of um, Nate and Trisha's developed cancer. After Christmas, they discovered it. And this is the 13th of March, and her funeral is today. She died, and her shit got worse so very quickly. And uh, it just lets you know how, and she's 53 years old, so that lets you know how many years of our time Grandpa and I have, and we're so thankful for them. If I am to go on living in the body, this will mean fruitful labor for me. Yet what shall I choose? I do not know. I am torn between two. I desire to depart and be with Christ, which is better by far. Because when I look at the way some things are going, I think that would be the best answer. But it's more necessary for, for you that I remain in the body. Convinced of this, I know that I will remain, and I will continue with all of you for your progress and joy in the faith, so that through my being with you, again, your joy in Christ Jesus will overflow on account of me. Whatever happens, conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. Then, whether I come and see you or only hear about you in my absence, I will know that you stand firm in one spirit, contending as one man for the faith of the gospel, without being frightened in any way by those who oppose you. This is a sign to them that I will be destroyed; they will be destroyed, but that you will be saved and that by God. For it has been granted to you on behalf of Christ not only to believe on him, but also to suffer for him, 
since you are going through the same struggle you saw I had, and now I hear that I still have, imitating Christ's humility, and I have written beside that Christian's pattern, Christian's model to follow. Chapter 2. If you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, if any comfort from his love, if any fellowship with the Spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and purpose. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, but in humility consider others better than yourself. Each of you should not only look to your own interests, but also to the interests of others. I went to World Day of Prayer on Friday night, and the one lady said she taught little first and second graders. And the lesson was on compassion, and she said to them, well, compassion is a pretty big word, and do you know what it means? And they were not sure of, as to what the meaning was. And she said, well, I can think of a little word that starts with the same letter and only has four letters in it. And I think it would mean just about the same thing to you as what compassion does. And the word was care. I care for you. And I remembered that. Your attitude should be the same as that of Christ Jesus. And now he's quoting from another part of the Bible, or probably the Old Testament. Who, being in the very nature of God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped but made himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man. He humbled himself and became obedient to death, even death on the cross. Therefore God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. Shining as stars. Therefore, my dear friends, as you have already always obeyed, not only in my presence, but how much more in my absence, continue to work up your salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you to will and to do according to his good purpose. Do everything without complaining or arguing. My, that's a verse that ought to be up in every home. So that you may become blameless and pure, children of God without fault in a crooked and depraved generation in which you shine like stars in the universe as you hold out the word of life in order that I may boast on the day of Christ that I did not run or labor for nothing. But even as I am poured out like a drink offering on the sacrifice and service coming from your faith, I am glad and rejoice with all of you. So you too should be glad and rejoice with me. I'm sure you realize the word jo rejoice is a nut of the same family as the word joy. And so we actually don't hear the word joy in this um, book so much, but we hear the word rejoice, which has the same meaning. Timothy and Epaphroditus, I hope in the Lord Jesus to send Timothy to you soon, that I also may be cheered when I receive news about you. I have no one else like him who takes a genuine interest in your welfare, but you know that Timothy has proved himself, because as a son with his father he has served with me in the work of the gospel. I hope, therefore, to send him as soon as I see how things go with me, and I am confident in the Lord that I myself will come soon. But I think it is necessary to send back to you Epaphroditus, my brother, fellow worker, and fellow soldier, who is also your messenger, whom you sent to take care of my needs. For he longs for all of you and is distressed because you heard he was ill. Indeed, he was ill and almost died, but God had mercy on him, and not on him only, but also on me, to spare me sorrow upon sorrow. 
Therefore, I am all the more eager to send him, so that when you see him again, you may be glad, and I may have less anxiety. Welcome him in the Lord with great joy, and honor men like him, because he almost died for the work of Christ, risking his life to make up for the help you could not give me. No confidence in the flesh. And this is chapter 3. Finally, my brethren, rejoice in the Lord. It is no trouble for me to write the same thing to you again, and it is a safeguard for you. Watch out for those dogs, those men who do evil, those mutilators of the flesh. For it is we who are the circumcision, we who worship by the Spirit of God, who glory in Christ Jesus, and who put no confidence in the flesh, though I myself have reasons for such a confidence. Uh, that last verse I don't really understand too well. If anyone else thinks he has reasons to put confidence in the flesh, I have more. Oh, I guess I understand now. And now Paul gives all the reasons why he can be proud of himself, or I shouldn't say proud, thankful for the family that he came from. And so this is his, sort of his resume of his life. I have more, circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, in regard to the law of Pharisee, and as for zeal, persecuting the church, as for legalistic righteousness for us. And those are the things that he would be on his resume, that he was a Pharisee of the Pharisees, and all of these things. And he had been taught at the feet of Gamaliel, a great teacher. But whatever was to my profit, I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. What is more, I consider everything a loss compared to the surprising greatness of knowing Christ, Jesus Christ my Lord, for whose sake I have lost all things. I consider them rubbish, and in some Bibles they say dung, and you as a farm girl might know what dung means, that I may gain Christ and be found in him, that all the worldly things, clothes, house, prestige, um, popularity, office, all those things are not the most important things in our life. But that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, because he had that righteousness from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness that comes from God and is by faith. I want to know Christ power of his resurrection and the fellowship of sharing his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, and so somehow to attain the resurrection of the dead. And that's what we're interested in also. Pressing on toward the goal. Not that I have already obtained all this or have already been made perfect, but I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. Brothers, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it, but one thing I do, and this is another famous verse, I'm sure you've heard many sermons on it, forgetting what is behind and straining for toward what is ahead, I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. I'm used to that verse in the King James Version a little better because that's when I learned. And in this version, it doesn't quite carry the same weight. I think I'll go find the King James and read it to you. Start with verse 12. Not as though I had already attained, either were already perfect, but I follow after, if that I may apprehend that for which I am apprehended of Christ Jesus, that apprehended cause trouble for people. Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended, um, but this one thing I do, now this is the part that's familiar, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth unto those things which are before, I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Let us therefore, as many of you be perfect, be thus minded. 
and if in anything ye be otherwise minded, God shall reveal this unto you. Okay, I'm going to go back now to the, the NIV. Verse 15, All of us who are mature should take a view of things, and if on some point you think differently, that too God will make clear to you. Only let us live up to what we have already attained. Join with others in following my pattern, my example, brothers, and take note of those who live according to the pattern we gave you. For as I have often told you before, and now say again, even with tears, many live as enemies of the cross of Christ. Their destiny is destruction, their God is their stomach, and their glory is in their shame. Their mind is on earthly things, but our citizenship is in heaven, and we eagerly await a Savior from there, the Lord Jesus Christ, who, by the power that enables him to bring everything under his control, will transform our lowly bodies so that we may be like his glorious body. And isn't that something to think about for the future? A lot more than all the things that are going on around here. Chapter 4. Therefore, my brethren, you whom I love and long for, my joy and crown, that is how you should stand firm in the Lord, dear friends. You see, in some of the books, like Corinthians, uh, Paul wrote and sort of took them to task because they were doing things that were wrong. And he wrote things like that to nearly all the other churches. But the the church of Philippi was his joy church, the one that he thanked God for every day and that didn't seem to have some of the problems that the other churches had. Now it talks about exhortations. I plead with Eudocia, I plead with Syntax, to agree with each other in the Lord, yes. And I ask you, loyal yoke fellow, help these women who have contended at my side in the cause of the gospel along with Clement and the rest of my fellow workers whose names are in the book of life. And it seems as if these two women had worked very hard when Paul was there, and then after Paul left, they got into an argument of some kind about how things should be done. And so he's asking them to please try to get together and uh, be harmonious in the church. Rejoice in the Lord always. And again I say rejoice, and you've all sung sung the song, Rejoice in the Lord always, and again I say rejoice, Rejoice in the Lord always, and again I say rejoice, 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 and again I say rejoice. I just think that's a beautiful little, little chorus. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything. But in everything by prayer and petition, and you know what petition means. We think of petition as where we go around and sign something and take it to a government official and say this is what we want done. But a petition is simply asking for something. And so prayer should be praise and asking, and a petition is just asking. So we should, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. And you've heard that as a benediction, I'm sure. And you know what the word benediction means too, don't you, honey? It means good saying, good writing. And so it was the last good wishes that you're given as you leave the church. Finally, brethren, whatever is true, whatever is noble, Whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think. And this is why I am so upset about the TV, about the books, and the newspapers, and the magazines that we have, because all they're bringing us up with is violence and horror and whatever can be the most shocking to us. And that is what God says. Whatever is lovely and of good report and excellent and praiseworthy, 
that that is what we should think about and not these others. And then he goes on to say, whatever you have learned or received or heard from me or seen in me, put into practice and the God of peace will be with you. And can you and I say that to someone, whatever you have seen in me, that do. So that tells us that he evidently had lived a life that was praiseworthy of the Lord. And that that's what you and I need to do also. Thanks for their gifts. Verse 10. I rejoice greatly in the Lord that at last you have renewed your concern for me. Indeed, you have been concerned, but you had no opportunity to show it. I am not saying this because I am in need. For I have learned to be content, whatever the circumstances. And that is another verse that's very meaningful. To be content in whatever our circumstances are. Whether we're poor, whether we're sickly, whether we have poor health, whether we have problems, learn to be content. I know what it is to be in need, and I know what it is to have plenty. I have learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. I can do everything through him who gives me the strength. Isn't that a verse to remember? I can do everything through him who gives me the strength. And I often think of the word wisdom. I pray for wisdom for us and for all our boys and for all your grandchildren. And the Proverbs say, you know, seek wisdom, ask wisdom, and the Lord will give it to you. So he gives us wisdom, and he gives us strength. Yet it was good of you to share in my troubles. Moreover, as you Philippians know, in the early days of your acquaintance with the gospel, when I set out from Macedonia, not one church shared with me in the matter of giving and receiving except you only. For even when I was in Thessalonica, you sent me aid again and again when I was in need. This is a reason he especially likes the church at Philippi. Not that I am looking for a gift, but I am looking for what may be credited to your account. I have received full payment and even more. I am amply supplied now that I have received from Epaphroditus the gifts you sent. They are a fragrant offering, and that was something the Jewish mentioned often, a fragrant offering. Acceptable sacrifice, pleasing to God, and my God will meet all your needs according to his glorious riches in Christ Jesus. To our God and Father be glory forever and ever. Amen. And final greetings. Greet all the saints in Christ Jesus. The brothers who are with me send greetings. All the saints send you greetings, especially those who belong to Caesar's household. Now do you get that? You see, he had said everybody knew about him. And so even though he was in change, he had witnessed to all of the guards and the cooks and the other people who were in the house and the prison where he was. And so all of them had heard of Jesus. So his time in chains was not wasted. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. Okay, the end of Philippians.